Hey, it's Father Steve, uh, Episcopal Priest, serving here in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. Uh, we're doing uh, the study of the book of Revelation. And uh, as you can tell, if you watched some of my previous recordings, I was like out by a barn. And now I'm back in the basement of Canterbury. So uh, anyway, um, thank you for uh, tuning in to us. Um, this is um, so kind of a, um, chapter 14 and chapter 15 of the Revelation Bible study is going to be kind of uh, part of 14 and part of 15. So last um, recording was all ch uh, was chapter 14, but only up to a certain point. So here's what we're going to look at for this um, recording. We're going to look at chapter 14, verse 14, through chapter 15, verse 8 of the book of Revelation. So that's where we're going to that's where we're going to pick up, and um, so, and also those who, um, the, besides the, the Bible being a resource, um, the other resource we use uh, is N.T. Wright for Everyone Bible Study Guides, Revelation 22 Studies for Individuals and Groups. And that's the book. Um, I really encourage you to use it. But also encourage you to not do um, Revelation, well, particularly Revelation, by yourself. Um, and don't speed through it. Um, we do a chapter a week, and we have uh, very good discussions, in-house discussions. And uh, I just encourage you, if you do, I'm not telling you not to purchase this book, but I also encourage you to um, do Bible study, you know, not only Revelation, do Bible study as a group, and uh, it's more, um, more fruitful. You know, you gain more uh, with more people in with your group than if you would just sit and read it by yourself. Okay, so uh, some of the notes I have for uh, Revelation Bible Study, chapter 14, verse 14 through chapter 15, verse 8. So we look at the first picture of the final judgment, a crown and a sickle. We'll see this uh, in our readings. Um, Christ wears a crown of the conqueror. Um, we go back to chapter 6, verse 2. But the sickle shows that he comes now in his role of judge, and we look at that in uh, Gospel John 5.27. Now, verse 18 of chapter 14, verse 18, there's only one altar in the heavenly temple. It serves for a holocaust. Uh, we look at uh, chapter 6, verse 9, and chapter 11, verse 1. A reminder of the blood of the martyrs, a cries for vengeance. And for incense offerings, uh, we go back to Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, chapter 8, verse 5, and chapter 9, verse 13, recalling that the prayers of the saints may hasten their end. Um, verse 19, the great wine press. From the time of post-exilic prophets, God's judgment against sinners has been likened to the work of a vinegar um, crushing grapes under foot. And then we go to the seven bowls are introduced. Uh, we look at that and we'll get to chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. that introduces a series of seven bowls. Also, we will look at that in chapter 16, verses 1 through 21, where we talk about these seven bowls. But we get the introduction in um, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, the introduction of the seven bowls. Uh, the seven last plagues. Uh, this is a definitive manifestation of God's anger. And then when we look at chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, the seven angels receive the bowls of God's wrath. Okay? So now, um, those are notes. Um, you could have went ahead and read what I said. We'll look at chapter 14, verse 14 through chapter 15, verse 8. So if you have not read that, go and read that, and then come back, and uh, we'll get into some questions from N.T. Wright. Okay? Okay, welcome back. Okay, so reaping the harvest and preparing the plagues. Imagine a village in the outlying countryside of ancient Judea. It's a long way from the city, and even traders don't come there that often, far less government officials. A circuit judge comes to the neighbor, neighboring town once every few months, if they're lucky, but that doesn't mean that nothing needs doing. A builder is cheated by a customer who refuses to admit his fault, a widow has her small purse stolen, and since she has nobody to plead for her, she can do nothing. A family is evicted from their home by a landlord who thinks he can get more rent from someone else. And a con artist has accused a work colleague of cheating him. 
and though nothing has been done about it, the other workers seem inclined to believe the charge, and so on. Nobody can do anything about any of these until the judge comes and justice is handed down. You can see where this is going, right? here. When he comes, expectations will be massive. Months of pent-up frustrations will boil over. The judge will have to keep order. He will have to hear each case properly and fairly, taking special care for those with nobody to speak up for them. And then he will decide. Judgment will be done. Chaos will be averted and order will be restored. The cheats will be put in their place. The thief punished and made to restore the purse. The village as a whole will heave a sigh of relief. Justice has been done. So we can see where this is going right. <laughs> okay, so kind of an uh, icebreaker question here. What wrongs do you know of that need to be corrected? How will you respond? What wrongs do you know that need to be corrected? How will you respond? Okay, it's going to a question. Um, looking at chapter fourteen, verses chapter fourteen, verses fourteen through twenty. What's the meaning of the symbols mentioned in verse fourteen that are used to describe the one like the Son of Man? What's the meaning of the symbols mentioned in verse fourteen that are used to describe the one like the Son of Man? Okay, you want to pause it? You can. Now, welcome back. <laughs> Next question. Um, it's kind of like a long uh, introduction to this question. And in and, and the interest of time, um, even though it's a good question, uh, maybe you'll re revisit another time, and maybe in person or whatever. But I'm going to kind of skip this because it deals with verse 20. And then I'm going to just skip on to another question here. How... Um, God will take even the wickedness and rebellion of the world and make it turn to his praise and to the salvation of his people. How does this passage bring you hope today? Now, what, what we're looking at, I think we're looking at um, verses 14 and 16. So, maybe what I need to do, <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and read this question. Okay, so let me go back and read this question. It's kind of a long, long intro. It may help with this next question. And it deals with verse 20. So this may help you with what I just asked you. Verse 20 offers a horrible sight of blood flowing out of the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for about 200 miles. The passage is often read as the story of great and terrifying judgment with Jesus himself executing God's wrath with his sickle, verses 14 and 16. And an angel from heaven gathering up the grapes of wrath understood as the wicked nations who were about to suffer God's eternal anger but the harvest imagery and the natural implications it would carry tell strongly against this. The previous chapter has warned God's people against worshiping a monster. The next chapter will see those same people with victory won singing the new song by the sea of glass. How have they come from the one place to the other? By, it seems, being themselves the harvest, the vintage of the Lord. These are images of salvation, not a condemnation. With, image, with this image of salvation through suffering, John is encouraging his readers to face the prospect of persecution in faith and patience. The whole passage is designed to convey a powerful message which we need today as much as ever. God's time will come. God will bring his people safely home. What if, in the face of the great evil and injustice that millions have faced in history, God did no more than say, there, there, boys will be boys. What would be the reaction of the victims of that evil? Let me um, repeat that last part. What if in the face of the great evil and, and injustice that millions have faced in history, God did no more than say, there, there, boys will be boys. What would be the reaction of the victims of that evil? You know, many things that could come up. I'm thinking of the Holocaust. So then it goes back to this question that I ask you. How then might we say that judgment is good? How then might we say that judgment is good?
Okay. Question. God will take even the wickedness and rebellion of the world and make it turn to his praise and to the salvation of his people. How does this message bring you hope today? Think about what we've been saying for the last couple of weeks. We know there's going to be suffering. We know there's going to be illness. But also, we're living in a part of part one and part two of God's creation. Think about that. Okay, now we're going to go to chapter 15. What is, the signif what is significant about the seven plagues the angels bring? And it starts right from verse 1. I'm going to look at uh, chapter 15. And we're going to go through up, up to verse 8. What is significant about the seven plagues the angels bring? Okay. Now looking at verse 3. Whose song do the martyrs sing? Whose song do the martyrs sing? And looking at verse 3 of chapter 15. Okay. Now we're going to get to um, about judgments of God. What are the judgments of God? The judgments of God mentioned in verse 4 that have been revealed in Revelation. And how do they draw the nations into worship the Lamb? So, it's a good question. What are the judgments of God mentioned in verse 4 that have been revealed in Revelation, and how do they draw the nations into, the worship, into worship the Lamb? Now, <laughs> it's kind of an interesting, interesting question coming up here. How might we explain God's judgments in a way that will draw people to the Lamb? How, will, how might we explain God's judgments in a way that will draw people to the Lamb? This might be one of those things where you kind of like get a highlighter and highlight chapter 15. Maybe take a, a picture up with your uh, smartphone and you carry it around with you. Okay, chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, verse 3 to 4 is called a Psalm of Moses. This recalls God's great act of judgment in Egypt and salvation for Israel when Moses brought Israel through the Red Sea. Likewise, the martyrs, those who have won the victory over the monster and over its image and over the number of its name, verse 2, have discovered that they have come through death to life. What happens in the temple after the angels are given the bowls of wrath? And that's verses 7 to 8. What happens in the temple after the angels are given the bowls of wrath? We good? So I have one more question here. And it's verse 8 of chapter 15. The reference in verse 8 to no one being able to enter the heavenly temple is reminiscent of 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, during the dedication of Solomon's temple. When the, when the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for well, the glory of the Lord filled his temple. How does this help us understand what is going on in uh, Verse 8 of chapter 15. Okay. So, let me, I think I might have to reread that so you don't have to stop this video and play it back. So let me reread re, re this question or this statement. The reference in verse 8 to no one being able to enter the heavenly temple is reminiscent of 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 10 through 11 during the dedication of Solomon's temple. When a priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and a priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. How does this help us understand what is going on in uh, chapter 15, verse 8? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to get back and do a note on Revelation 14.20 N.T. Wright talks about. Remember, there's a lot of symbolism, a lot of symbolism in Revelation. 
pretty much is all, all symbolism. So here's a note that N.T. Wright writes about on Revelation uh, chapter 14, verse 20. Okay, here's what he says. When speaking of 200 mile long river blood, we must once again remind ourselves that we are reading a symbolic prophecy, not a literal one. The idea of something flowing away from a city and being measured for depth carries a distance memory of the water of life which flows from the city at the end of Ezekiel chapter, that's chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. It may be that John, with his visionary imagination working overtime, sees the swelling river blood as playing a similar role, though whether it will be to effect a further work of grace or a further work of judgment, we cannot easily say. Of course, at the end of Revelation 22, verses 1 through 6, remember there's 22 chapters of Revelation. Of course, at the end of Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 6, we also see a river flowing out of the city. This one, as in Ezekiel, is the water of life. Okay? So there we go. Um, our study on this one uh, kind of broken up into two chapters. Um, going back last week, chapter 14, verse 14, through chapter 15, verse 8 of the study of the book of Revelation. Uh, Father Steve, Episcopal priest serving here in the Diocese of Maryland. Uh, God bless.